In this video, we continue on with the book titled Self-Development, A Handbook for the Ambitious by Henry Addington Bruce. It is in the public domain. And hello, hello, I am Daisy, your hostess. If you're new to my channel, I'm so glad you found us. And to our subscribers, welcome back. Thank you so much for your support, for your likes, for your comments. I really do look forward to them. So the next chapter that we're going to move on to is titled How to Talk Well. I am looking forward to that. And I hope I'm going to find some golden nuggets there. Before I move on, I'd like to share a couple highlights regarding the previous chapters titled How Reading Helps and the Use of Words. And again, if you're new and you found us at this video and would like to catch up on this pretty interesting book, please visit the playlist. I gather you have figured out that I like books. And and I'm very much so at a very young age, I realized that because my parents were immigrants and my mom would come to me when I was reading um, just materials that the teachers gave me for homework, she was fascinated with the language and she wanted to learn. I figured, okay, well, I'm teaching my mom stuff from books. There's got to be something great in here. And as time went on, uh, the book's content began to change more of the self-help because again, I felt that my parents didn't have all the answers. And so I do have a great variety of books. And I'm just going to take a minute to uh, go through some of the books in my library. But I really became an avid reader collector in my 30s. Some of the books that I have is like the Edinburgh and Door Lectures on Mental Science, Think and Grow Rich from Napoleon Hill. I have new acquisitions to my library are the first and second volume of Isis Unveiled by Bavlatsky in hardcover. I love that. I have him in hardcover. I have some modern books uh, such as From Good to Great by Jim Collins and I believe everyone should have one of these in their library. The Art of War by Sun Tzu. I also have The Kabbalah by Anne Williams Heller and I do even mention him a lot here on this channel. Greg Braden's Awakening to Zero Point, one of his first books. I have uh, probably an author that you may not hear a lot about, but I will bring to the channel in a, his content is, is um, still in copyright, but it's uh, Stuart Wilde and his book is The Quickening and he has many others that I do have in my library. Also, I love fantasy fiction and I have The Lord of the Rings in hardcover, woohoo! And I also uh, have Terry Goodkind, which he passed away in the recent years, but I do have his whole series of The Wizard's First Rule. I love that book. I believe that Disney did a bad job in, in turning it into a movie because it is very horrific in some of the uh, details, which took away from me the, the spice. I do love the, uh, the book version. And I, I imagine because it was Disney, they had to soften it up a little bit. And I do have my old time classic, my uh, Bible, which I've had since uh, since forever. But I do have a, our favorite one, which is uh, belongs to my husband and I when we got married over 31 years ago. And it's a daily read for me. And the one thing is that the beautiful content that these books bring, it's like these authors become your best friend. They're your companion and you're listening to them. And again, like the author mentioned, a good book invites you to come back, not only once, not only twice, maybe three or four times. And one of the things is when you can bring a friend along in your adventure of reading. My friend Lee uh, took on the adventure of reading The Wizard's First Rule, and he'd come over on weekends, and I'd make tea, and we would just talk about that, and it was this fantastic fantasy. We were reliving it all over again. Funny thing that during that time, I believe the online game, Ultima Online, came on, and uh, we were playing that, and it was fantastic, because it kind of added to the fun of the uh, adventure. The other thing is like I read the Bible and I love calling my mom and we talk about some of the points and how it relates to everyday life. So books are beautiful and the friendships that we make with other people, but mostly with the author who has taken you on this wonderful experience, this wonderful adventure. And the other chapter was titled The Use of Words, which is one of the reasons I love reading is adding new words to my vocabulary. Sometimes I just want to keep reading uh, because I want to get to the juicy part of the story or the content, but I stop myself. I've learned to stop myself, to pause, to write the word down, to look it up, to see its context, and then to bring it back into the context of what the author is using it. 
And I love that. And considering that I have two languages, so my vocabulary is stretched in in two, two languages. My husband, he's from Czech Republic, so he has his language. I've added a few of his words just to my vocabulary, but I'm not fluent in Czech. Sometimes I catch myself how I use a word and I try to fix it. And I know sometimes a word might slip and you may have noticed it. And that is the the Spanish coming out where in Spanish there's a lot of phonetic use to a word. Uh, here's an example like the, the word automobile. It's automobile, very simple. If it, it flows out like silk, in Spanish it is very different. A pronunciated a little bit different. It would sound more like automobile. So it's sometimes I, I play with that because I'm reading and I, I catch it and then it's like, oh wait, that's not how it's said and have to go back and fix that. So from, from this book so far, I've picked up two new words. One is vituperative. It's an adjective and it means something characterized by verbal abuse or censuring. And I said, wow, this is an interesting word. I had to go to the dictionary. Then I had to go to the pronunciation because it was like, how, how what does it mean? And how do you say this word? The other word was somnolent, and in the context that the author wrote it, I could understand that it had to do with sleepiness or drowsiness, and that is exactly what what it means. Somnolent means sleepy and drowsy, beautiful word. The word somnolent has the the letters S-O-M-N, which are the same letters in the word insomnia, which has to do with something about sleep, right? So it's beautiful. The, The words help you add more to your vocabulary. When you add more to your vocabulary, you can express things with a little more spice and a little more color. It's almost like painting a stick man when you begin to paint. It's just the stick man. But then when you begin to learn a little bit about angles, and and form and geometry, you begin to create a little more texture to your stick man. It becomes softer and now you begin to see cheekbones and you begin to add hair and all this beautiful stuff. That is what words do to our dialogue, our conversation. And it allows us to really create a more colorful speech. I am very happy that this author added these two chapters to this book because it definitely is very important in self-development. And I like how he said it's self-development for the ambitious. If you want to go throughout life with the way that you're at and you're very happy with that, that's fine. But definitely for the ambitious, not the ambitious so much of money, but the ambitious of having that very colorful life. And and it's like, it's, it's not only looking at the tree, but the ambition of sitting under its shade. It's the ambition of looking at the details on the leaves, eating the fruit, maybe taking that seed and planting it in the ground. It's just expressing and enjoying all of what life has to offer. And with that, let's move on to the next chapter titled, How to Talk Well. Ability to use words with due regard to their meaning helps, as just indicated, to develop conversational power for business or social purposes. And the importance of possessing conversational power can hardly be overestimated. But to become a first-class conversationalist requires a good deal more than knowing what words to use when talking with other people. For one thing, and indispensably, it requires real breadth of interest, especially interest in matters truly of account which is something too many people, if pressed on the point, would have to confess that they lack. There are some people, I might say a great many people, who seldom talk of anything except happenings that have annoyed them. When they talk at all, it usually is to find fault, and they may have a great deal about which they think they ought to find fault, from the weather to their state of health. There are other people whose conversation is almost entirely centered in their household affairs. I know one woman who is so obsessed with the management of her home that she incessantly inflicts on all her friends long recitals concerning her cook, her meals, her house cleaning, and all the other routine of home life. She will go into this in the most tedious detail with anybody who will listen to her. Poor woman. Today, she has not nearly as many friends as she used to have. On a par with her are those numerous persons 
whose daily talk is virtually limited to business matters great or small. They talk only in terms of money, of making or losing it, of the state of the market, of the trickery of competitors, and so forth. Nothing seems to be of any importance to them or of the slightest interest unless there is a business end to it. Then they will talk briskly, though not always illuminatingly. Gossip forms the subject matter of the talk of others, perhaps not malicious gossip, but gossip just the same. In its range, it sweeps from the doings of neighbors to the latest criminal sensation. And then there are people who, refraining from gossip about their friends and acquaintances, gossip eternally about themselves, mostly in a boastful, unduly self-assertive way. These are among the most unfortunate of all conversationalists, for they not merely find it difficult to obtain listeners, but they impel those who do listen to form harsh and not unjustly harsh opinions of them. To boast is to feel the need of boasting, as has indeed been pointed out already in the chapter on defense reactions. The strong, energetic, really successful man is too busy planning new achievements to stop to plume himself on past ones. Besides, he is not worrying about the way others appraise him. He knows that he is doing well and that he can continue to do well. That is enough for him. He is quite content to let his work speak for itself. The boaster, on the contrary, by the very fact of his boasting, betrays a curious lack of self-confidence. His boasting amounts to a confession that he is surprised at himself for ever having done anything worth boasting about. The discerning recognize this and judge the boaster accordingly. Unless obliged, they would not think of entrusting him with work of great responsibility, for they know that he is a weak man, liable to fail in an emergency. Also, they know that even those whom his boasting might delude would be repelled by the egotism which the boasting indicates all too plainly. This means that he would find it hard to get along with others and would be that much the more handicapped for real achievement. If then you notice in yourself any tendencies to boastfulness, consider their significance. Always remember that the more you boast, the less likely are you to accomplish things really worthwhile. Remember that success comes by doing, not talking. Remember that if you really do well, others will praise you and you will be under no necessity of praising yourself. Nay, more than this, in all things, follow the maxim along laid down by the great Francis Bacon. Speech of a man's self ought to be seldom and well chosen. There are people, many of them, not at all boastful, who delight in talking much about themselves and their affairs. Even among strangers, they are uneasy unless they can bring the conversation to a point where they can enlarge on their personal and often petty interests. Such people stamp themselves small, narrow, and abnormally self-centered. And, like the boastful egotist, they drive others from them. Do you know so-and-so? I asked a friend the other day. Oh, yes, I know him, was his answer but I don't know him very well, and I must say, I don't want to know him very well. Would you like to learn why? He went on emphatically. I'll tell you. It's because he bores people to death with his everlasting talk about himself. He doesn't seem to have an idea about anything except what he eats and drinks, the prices he pays, and all that sort of thing. The other day he was with me for an hour in the train, Every time I forced him to talk of something that didn't directly concern himself, he had hardly a word to say. No, sir, that man's not my kind of man. This is the verdict the world in general reaches regarding those who talk too much about self. It may be a harsh verdict, but it is a natural one. Indeed, it is an inevitable one. Habitual self-discussing of any kind is, in truth, a dangerous and costly a thing as self-praising. 
nor is it enough for men and women who would become really good conversationalists to avoid self-discussion and to cultivate breadth of interest. They must always bear in mind that conversation is not synonymous with monologue. That is, when talking with other people, they must give those others a fair chance to do some talking themselves. Or, to put it otherwise, the art of conversation involves ability to listen well no less than to speak fluently and entertainingly. And the fact is that many otherwise excellent conversationalists rob themselves of the advantages this confers by failure to be good listeners. This antagonizes people who have their own ideas on a subject and are deprived of rightful opportunity to express those ideas. Let them try to do so, and they are promptly interrupted with questions or objections. This is not polite, and it is not politic. No matter how strong one's beliefs may be, no matter how impatient one may feel at another person's statements, that other should be given a chance to talk. By refusing to give him a chance, by rudely interrupting him, one may indeed do more than antagonize him. One may miss an opportunity to learn something it is to one's advantage to know. No man is infallible. No man has a monopoly of wisdom. Every man is liable to be in error, to hold wrong beliefs. And if a man is not a good listener, if he is so opinionated that he must do all the talking, he necessarily throws away many a chance to enlarge his knowledge and have wrong beliefs corrected. There is another way in which many men fail to be good listeners. They do not interrupt, but they do not pay attention. No matter how earnestly another man may be speaking to them, they let their thoughts flit far from what he is saying. Possibly they are preoccupied with personal cares and problems. Possibly they are not at all interested in the subject of conversation. Possibly they are persons who find it hard to keep their attention fixed on anything. Whatever the reason, the fact remains that they are inattentive and that the other man is sure to perceive that they are paying no heed to his words. He is sure to perceive this, if only because their inattentiveness will betray itself in the vacant, faraway expression of their eyes. Naturally, he will feel aggrieved. Consciously or unconsciously, he will make a mental note of the way his conversational effort was received. At some future day, he may exact a penalty out of all proportion to the offense given. Of course, however, one should not make the opposite mistake of becoming a listener only, and if it is a great mistake to be not merely boastful and opinionated, but too talkative in general, too ready to tell all that one knows, to confide one's problems and perplexities to other people, it is an even greater mistake to make it a practice of keeping everything to oneself. Excessive talkativeness will make a man a nuisance. Excessive reticence will have the same effect of driving people from one. In addition, it is liable to give rise to an unhealthy habit of brooding, which is disastrous to efficiency and may be disastrous to health. To escape this danger, one does not need to go to the extreme of wearing one's heart on one's sleeve, but one does need, when occasion rises, to ease one's mind of troubles by telling them to some friend. People are to be found so reticent that when they are ill, they make it exceedingly hard for their doctor to find out what is wrong with them. They volunteer scarcely any information as their symptoms. They answer the doctor's question in monosyllables. Often they omit to mention facts which would render the situation clear to him. As a result, such abnormally reticent folk, far more than other men, are likely to become victims of a wrong diagnosis. In business, their reticence may similarly cost them dear. There are times, to be sure, when silence is precious. There are other times when it is indispensable to talk, and to talk frankly and fully. The man afflicted with the over-reticence does not appreciate this. 
He is silent when he should speak out, and as a consequence, he unwittingly misleads people and may cause them to take action much to his detriment. Then he begins to feel that he is misunderstood. It is undeniably hard to understand anybody who says no more than he can help saying. But the reticent man ignores his own share in any misunderstanding his reticence causes. He becomes bitter in mind, withdraws more and more into his shell of silence, and broods. If he broods long enough and hard enough, the effect is sure to be some degree of mental derangement. Outright insanity has resulted in some cases, the victim developing abnormal suspiciousness and delusions of persecution. At best, he will become an uncomfortable, difficult man to get along with. This makes for unhappiness and failure in life. It may even transform a prosperous man into a broken, wandering derelict. The tramp problem is in some measure a product of undue reticence. Take stock of yourself, my friend. Observe not only whether you talk too much, but also whether you talk too little. If you find that when in company or in the family circle you have a habit of sitting monotonously silent, begin to loosen your tongue a bit. Think of interesting things with which to brighten the general conversation. Above all, make it a practice to confide in your wife, your mother, your father, or some discreet friend when anything greatly troubles you. No longer keep yourself perpetually corked up. If you do, there may some day occur within you a psychic explosion that will be most damaging to you. End of chapter. Stay right here in this video as we move on to the next chapter. Before I get started, please be kind enough and hit that like button. Also, if you know of anyone that could benefit from this video, please do share it with them. And if you'd like to get notified of future videos, do subscribe to the channel. All right, get ready. Next chapter, Face the Unpleasant. Reticence, such as we have found so deplorable, springs from various causes. Among these, one of the outstanding is unwillingness to face unpleasant facts. This itself, quite apart from the excessive reticence it may engender, is a life handicap so serious that it calls for somewhat extended discussion, the need for which is emphasized by the sad circumstance that the world abounds in people who not only are unwilling to face the unpleasant, but by one means or another try to evade it. Unhappily, whatever the means chosen to dodge trouble, the ultimate result is almost certain to be more trouble, perhaps trouble of a catastrophic sort. To illustrate by a quotation from an acute observer of men and events, quote, a young man employed in a large store happened to mention to me recently that, rather than run the risk of being reported to the management, he had practiced a deception on one of his customers. By way of excuse, he urged that if he had confessed his fault, which was due to rush of work, he might have been discharged. It seems to me that he was mistaken in thinking this, at any rate, Consider the other side of the question. One lie or deception almost always demands another or a chain of them to make the first one good. The result is a dangerous tendency fixed in the character and the almost complete certainty of being in the end found out. End quote. There is a sound philosophy in this for every young man starting in business. For the matter of that, Every man and every woman, whether starting in life or well advanced in years, cannot too clearly recognize that in affairs of any kind, trouble dodging does not pay. I might add that there would be far less of it if people generally took the attitude toward making mistakes voiced in Sir William Osler's advice to a group of young physicians. Quote, Start out with the conviction that absolute truth is hard to reach in matters relating to our fellow creatures, that slips in observation are inevitable even with the best trained faculties, 
that errors of judgment must occur in the practice of an art which consists largely in balancing probabilities. Start, I say, with this attitude of mind, and mistakes will be acknowledged and regretted. But instead of a slow process of self-deception with ever-increased inability to recognize truth, you will draw from your errors the very lessons which may enable you to avoid their repetition. End quote. Not young physicians only, but all young men beginning their chosen careers may well take to heart this soundly practical advice. No matter what a young man's business, he will profit by heeding Sir William Osler's words. It is a peculiarity of human nature that, at the age when one's life work is usually begun, a common tendency is to feel in need of no instruction. Youth knows it all, but youth, being inexperienced, is certain to make mistakes. The danger is that the superlative certitude of youth, coupled with the superlative pride of youth, may create a condition of unwillingness to acknowledge errors in judgment and in conduct. If this occurs, and if a habit is formed of trying to cover up mistakes by excuses and prevarications, progress in the chosen career becomes next to impossible. For as everybody knows, or ought to know, mistakes have a real value as aids to self-improvement. The man who does not acknowledge and regret his mistakes is obviously in no mood to learn from them. Observant employers of labor have long been aware of this, as one such has put it, quote, I make it a rule to get rid as quickly as possible of any young man overready with excuses. On the other hand, I try to be as patient as possible with the young man who frankly owns up to mistakes. The former is not merely trying to hoodwink me. He is deceiving himself into a false belief in his ability. Unwilling to admit that he does anything badly, he will continue to make mistakes to the detriment of my business. The second young man, recognizing wherein he has erred, is in a position to avoid similar mistakes in the future. Profiting from the lessons of his mistakes, he will gradually acquire a fund of practical working knowledge most valuable to me as well as to himself. For that reason, I am willing to overlook much in his case and give him ample opportunity to make good. End quote. And, in fact, no man unless always so inert that he has led a useless existence can boast of a past absolutely free from mistakes. When the telephone was in its infancy, Alexander Graham Bell needed a large sum of money to enable him to develop his wonderful invention. He knew that one of his acquaintances was an intimate friend of the head of a large New York financial house. Through his acquaintance, he sought to interest the financier in the telephone. The New York capitalist, who died a few years ago worth many millions, listened attentively while the merits and possibilities of the new invention were set forth to him. He promised to give his decision next day, and next day he announced with blunt directness, I'm afraid that, just at present, I don't want to go into the toy business. The history of the telephone proves that, in this instance, the financier made a big mistake. Doubtless he made others, but, working energetically and persistently, he still could achieve a tremendous success. In Lower Broadway, New York, there stands today the most beautiful office building in the world, the Woolworth Building. To me, it is one of the most beautiful buildings of any kind. It was erected by a merchant whose colossal fortune grew out of a novel idea for disposing of goods at extremely low prices. This merchant got his idea while he was a clerk working for a small pay. He resigned from his position and, with borrowed money, opened a store of his own in order to put the idea to the test of actual trial. His venture failed but it failed simply because he had made the mistake of opening his five and ten cent store in an unsuitable location. He borrowed some more money, moved to another city, and started a second store in a section where there was much demand for cheap wares. There he laid the foundations for one of the most astonishing successes in the history of American merchandising. 
So you see, the ablest of men may make serious mistakes, but they never make the great mistake of refusing to acknowledge their errors, of being unwilling to face unpleasant facts. This truly is the mistake of mistakes, inviting trouble without end. There even are circumstances under which trouble dodging, flight from the unpleasant, may have the effect of cutting life needlessly short. Here is a man, for example, who begins to feel unaccountably tired and weak. Friends advise him to consult a doctor. He brushes the advice aside. I don't need any doctor, he says. I'll be all right soon. I'm just a little run down. The fact is that the mere thought of going to a doctor is unutterably unpleasant to him, and he has never been trained to face the unpleasant. But after a time, the services of a doctor are imperatively in order. The doctor looks him over, then demands, Why didn't you come to me long ago? Then it would have been easy to get you well again. Now it may be pretty difficult. The truth is, though the doctor does not tell him this, that it has become impossible to help him back to health, a disease curable only in its early stages has seized firmly upon him all because of his refusal to face the unpleasant. Or take another man of an exceedingly common type. Feeling unwell, he too fails to consult a doctor because he dreads the idea of doing so. But his failure to consult a doctor does not enable him to dodge the unpleasant. He begins to wonder what is the matter with him. He imagines all sorts of things, working himself into a state of nervous collapse. Had he gone to the doctor in the first place, he would have escaped all this, for the doctor, finding nothing seriously wrong, would have given him the reassurance needed to put his mind at ease. Again, there comes into my mind the image of a man now miserably passing his days in a hospital for the mentally diseased. Twenty years ago, he was a man of real ability. He had worked up a good position. He was happily married and had a comfortable home. In an evil moment, the desire seized him to get rich quick. He read of fortunes made overnight in the stock market, so he began to dabble in stocks. He had the beginner's luck. This spurred him to venture further. Then he passed into the loser's class. The more he lost, the more he worried. Soon sleep failed to come to him with its accustomed regularity. Beset by worry and insomnia, he found it increasingly difficult to attend to his business duties. A daily bracer became indispensable to him. Presently, he was indulging in several bracers every day. A friend warned him that he was in danger of losing his place. Another bluntly told him that drink was getting the better of him. These were facts, cold, hard facts. Because they were cold and hard, he refused to face them. Drink did get the better of him. His business judgment steadily declined. He lost his place. He lost his home. And one day it was found that he had lost his mind. Other men in other ways court disaster by refusing to face facts. There are many to whom work is an unpleasant thing which they would fain evade. It is easy to be idle, so they idle. But soon or later they discover that idleness brings with it some most unpleasant penalties, as flight from the unpleasant always does. Face the unpleasant, therefore, if you would make the pleasant certain. Endure present pain, that you may have future peace. These are rules of conduct which the wise ever put into effect. To put them into effect, character training is the great thing needed. A habit of facing the unpleasant must be developed, and a splendid way to develop it is hinted in William James' sapient counsel. Keep the faculty of effort alive by a little gratuitous effort every day. That is to say, every day do something that you do not really have to do, that is not altogether pleasant, but that you appreciate you ought to do. Then, when critical situations arise, when you find yourself confronted by the exceedingly unpleasant, you will be sure manfully to face it, not to take refuge in flight. End of chapter. All right, this is really good, but there is still more. So please do hit that like button, subscribe to the channel, and head over to the next video where we continue with 
work and vacations. See you there.